Hey guys, how's it going? This has been a long time in the making, and I'm proud to present to you today the Time Splitters 2 Retrospective. In this video, I want to showcase this amazing game from my childhood that so many people missed out on. It's a bit of a cult classic, and there are still online communities celebrating it to this day. Without further ado, let's jump into the Time Splitters 2 Retrospective. Time Splitters 2 is a sequel to the first Time Splitters game. The previous title was mostly about retrieving items and returning to spawn with them as quickly as possible. There were a few game modes, but it was pretty lacking when it came to replayability. I actually played Time Splitters 2 first, and I'm happy to say that Time Splitters 2 brought with it much more in terms of content. Looking into the development of the game reveals few details. In 1999, a few members of the gaming company Rare, known for titles such as GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, Donkey Kong Country, and more, left to create their own company called Free Radical Design. They finished and released Time Splitters 1, and immediately went to work on a sequel. Within 23 months, the newfound company completed Time Splitters 2. Interestingly, about half the time spent in production was said to be centered around perfecting the first level, Siberia. This is due to the fact that Siberia is an homage to a level in GoldenEye 007, which also takes place in the Siberian Dam. Graham Norgit, who also made the music for GoldenEye, tried to capture the same essence with the soundtrack for the new mission. When the game released in 2002, it did so on multiple consoles. It quickly became a PlayStation Greatest Hit and an Xbox Classic. Regardless of that latter title, all they could come up with for a comment on the game was, First Halo, now this, which just serves to put it back in Halo's shadow. It also released in multiple locations with multiple finished iterations. For example, the PlayStation version had smaller window screens for the minigames, such as Anaconda and Astrolander, which we'll discuss later. Because of this, higher scores were possible on the Xbox and GameCube editions. In Japan, the game was released under a different title and strangely lacked the map editor function. It was now called Time Splitters Invaders of History, which honestly does make sense. Several different cover arts were created for different countries as well. The story of Time Splitters 2 is fairly interesting. Free Radical sought to sow an overarching narrative that gave import to the missions rather than repeat its history of Time Splitters 1, where story took a back seat to fast-paced gameplay. This game takes the sci-fi trope of time travel and forms it into a plausible and entertaining gameplay experience. Individual missions will be discussed in an upcoming section. Here, I'll explain the story in summary. In short, a race of aliens called the Time Splitters is bent on the destruction of the human race. Rather than simply fight them in combat, they have chosen a more devious route. The Time Splitters have created a time portal and are using it to jump back into the past and cause havoc in the timeline of human development. By using the time crystals, ostensibly as anchoring points in time, yeah, you're gonna hear the word time a lot in this video, these aliens go back in history to select different morally questionable characters, which they can exploit into causing problems for humanity in the future. This would alter the timeline to a point where humans wouldn't be so powerful, or if possible, one in which they would not exist at all. To disrupt this plan, Sergeant Cortez and Corporal Hart are sent into the Time Splitters space station. Their goal is to follow the Time Splitters into the past and retrieve the crystals, while also cleaning up the resulting historical issues as they do. While fighting near the time portal, Corporal Hart decides she'll stay back and defend it, should the Splitters make it through and lock Cortez back in time. Agreeing on this plan, Cortez goes alone into different points in history. When transported into these different eras, Cortez takes the place of someone who is canonically in that area at that time. This allows him to complete his objectives without creating some sort of paradox. After collecting all nine time crystals and eliminating evildoers, Cortez returns to the space station. There, Corporal Hart is unfortunately killed by the splitters, leaving Cortez to complete his mission alone. Taking the time crystals, he runs through the space station, hacking in and setting off a self-destruct sequence. With little time to spare, he makes his way back to the spaceship and leaves sending the Splitters a parting gift of two missiles. Confirming the station is toast, Cortez sets on a track back home. Ouch. Yeah. That's hard mode. Another thing that turned people off from playing this game with me was just how freaking difficult it is. Oh shoot, I forgot. We're on hard mode. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's okay. We're gonna die on this part because this is too freaking hard. All right. Even that deserves a restart. All right. So what we're gonna do next is get shot in the face with a crossbow. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's the end. He hasn't even made it to it. Let's just watch. Before getting into the specifics of different missions, it should be mentioned that the difficulty choice in Time Splitters 2 is different than in other video games. The enemies do gain higher health and damage with higher difficulty choices, but there's another twist. With each difficulty, the level lengthens and more objectives are made mandatory. This means that, if you only play through on easy, you only get part of the canonical story. Also, normal itself is considered by many to be hard mode. Enemies deal massive damage, basically have aimbot, and beating missions often requires memorizing enemy and weapon spawn locations to a T. Additionally, health cannot be regained. The player can only make use of shields that either give a full additional health bar or only a half. These shields vary in availability depending on difficulty, as one would expect. Also, playing in cooperative mode means each player has less health in order to balance the mission. Another important thing to cover is the aiming system. Timesplitters 2 had two aiming types. One was a simple but reliable auto-aim, paced only by the weapon itself. The other was a floaty, messy, and frustrating crosshair. If using a sniper, you had to use this method and wait until your character finally hovered over the right spot for a millisecond. Perhaps the most damning aspect of the campaign in general is its reluctance to give players checkpoints. In each mission, except for Return to Planet X, there's only a singular checkpoint. Although missions can typically be beaten within 20 minutes or less, that time is expanded when you die and are respawned halfway through the mission in some cases. This means that you are forced to replay sections in their entirety before getting to the part that caused you grief. Trust me, it can and will be frustrating. This, along with the poor free aim mechanic, can be annoying to those who haven't yet tempered their patience with this game. Now we will discuss the missions in detail. This section will describe the story events of each mission, the level design, and the musical accompaniment. The first mission takes place in 1990 Siberia, at the fictional Obelisk Dam, during the end of the Cold War. The player inhabits the body of Ilsa Nadir, who, along with her partner Gregor Lenko, has been sent to infiltrate the dam and destroy the recent discoveries made there. The Russians have found an organic specimen, a reaper splitter that was preserved in the ice from over 10,000 years ago. This means that the time splitter who jumped to this location met a poor fate and landed at an ice deposit, unable to move or carry out any further plans. As it was holding a time crystal, that too was taken by the Russian soldiers. Ilsa and Gregor were able to find this enclosed splitter and explode it, removing any chance that it could be used for ill purposes. But the Russians had not only discovered the frozen splitter, they had also taken some of its DNA and spliced it into their soldiers, hoping to empower them. This had deadly consequences, however, leading to near zombification of the subjects. The resulting mutants were placed in detention cells behind laser walls. As Ilsa and Gregor made their way through the dam, they deactivated some of these barriers by obtaining a disc from the medical room and gaining access to the mainframe. This allowed the failed experiments to escape and wreak havoc on the station. Special forces were deployed to the location, attempting to destroy what remained of the mistakes. The duo of spies managed not only to destroy the special forces, but also the remaining mutants. Throughout their mission, they also destroyed secret files within cabinets, making sure that intel which would reinvigorate these experiments would never see the light of day. As they moved to the top of the dam for pickup, they were met with more troopers in a large gunship. Using the mounted turrets on the dam, Cortez, in the body of Ilsa, shot off the gun emplacements and sent the gunship into a devastating tailspin before leaving in a time portal and returning to the space station with a single crystal. The Obelisk Dam is a pretty neat area, situated between the frozen waters. The buildings are all of sheet metal and cheap wood, implying that this camp was hastily set up. The valves exposing highly pressurized steam are another factor that reinforces the idea that this dam is not operated with the utmost efficiency. Across the water, the building connects to the hydroelectric processing center, which clearly has had new digging operations occurring under its ice and rock. New rooms must have been created in which to throw the misshapen bodies of research subjects. 
mounted turrets in key areas give reason to believe that much more is going on here than power generation. As far as traversal, the map is pretty fun to run through. That is, if you don't forget to explode the communications dish and filing cabinets. If you do and reach the power room, you'll have a checkpoint, meaning you have to do a full rerun of the mission each time you fail fighting the gunship. For the weaponry, you are allotted the Temporal Uplink, a mainstay stealth machine throughout the campaign, as well as many weapons of the time period. These include the SK-47, Silence Pistol, Tactical 12 Gauge, reminiscent of GoldenEye's shotgun, and more. Most of them fit the time period, fill a specific role, and are damn fun to use. See, see what I did there? And of course, there's everyone's favorite weapon, the fire extinguisher. If aimed down, the player can fire it and run forward, relieving themselves of the burning sensation. If you're missing this tool, just run and hit the showers. Ultimately, the fists are the most fun weapon, because you can blast melons into little bits. The music for this mission is very reminiscent of GoldenEye 007, the game to which the entire mission is an homage. The track gives a spy-like intrigue while also having some dark tones which emphasize the danger of the mission. Some of the higher tones elicit a feeling of this being a suicide mission, with the music speaking as if it were a sad truth that this event had to take place. Then, just as you think you're done with the mission, a giant gunship flies up to your position on the dam. The music is ramping. You're surrounded by troopers and forced to spin around in an unfamiliar weapon designed by the enemy. Eventually, you emerge victorious, exploding the ship and escaping the dam as planned. This time, Cortez takes the place of a detective in downtown Chicago called Jake Fenton. He works under the company of his boss, Lady Jane. The two of them are on a mission to infiltrate the new deals of a mafia boss named Big Tony. Many cops turn a blind eye to the crime as they are paid off, but Fenton could not allow this. He quit the force and now works with a group of good-hearted people who want to make Chicago safe. Big Tony usually runs a lot of forced insurance scams and sells liquor regardless of the prohibition laws, the barrels of which are drained by Fenton and Jane as they make their way through the town. Now though, he's been offered shipments of strange gems, including one large green gem which ends up being a time crystal. Unbeknownst to the Mafia, they are working with time slitters who ostensibly are disguising themselves as other shady human characters. Moving through the dark streets from the docks, Fenton and Jane kill any ill-doer that stands in their way. Eventually, the brother of the Mafia boss tries to escape in a squad car, attempting to spread these deals further out from the city. The duo stops him, blasting off a wheel and exploding the vehicle. Fenton and Jane then protect civilians as Mafia members enter O'Leary's, a bar referencing that from Perfect Dark. After these Mafia members are dealt with, they play some pool and then meet up with the informant. Help to shoot this shot. I don't know. This is a very difficult shot, especially. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. We're looking at the cue ball. Oh my! Oh. Well, that was really. Did he break his thing? The informant is a man named Marco the Snitch. He's full of useful information, but is dangerous, drawing upon him all number of attempted assailants. Managing to get him home safe, Fenton and Jane are then given TNT and told to blast open Tony's safe in his office. All right. Okay, sorry, that guy scared me. In the safe is a keycard to the Sunrise Club, which is Tony's notorious hangout spot. After scaling the nearby building and getting the card, they receive a call from Marco. Hey, it's Marco. Find a window and check outside. There's some guys out to get you. Okay. Snipers have been positioned throughout the valley. Fenton, inhabited by Cortez, grabs a sniper and manages to take them out one by one. Fenton and Jane then move through a valley of snipers, picking them off and then calling a taxi to run through into the gated Sunrise Club. Here, the two complete their mission, killing Tony and taking the time crystal. No more shady business will be done in there, Chicago. Chicago's level design is pretty decent, I'd say. The mission is quite linear, but the multitude of enterable buildings gives an illusion of the city being far more filled than it actually is. The night atmosphere is also a good choice, adding to the noir style that many associate with the Chicago setting. The trains moving throughout the entire map is another neat detail. You can see them from the beginning of the level all the way through the last outdoor section. There's also the taxi service which is necessary for completing the mission. I wish more places had public transportation these days. The bar reference to Perfect Dark is also cool, and playing pool is even cooler. As this is my sister's favorite level, we would always stop in here and take turns shooting the pool balls until they were all gone. You can also open the cash register here for whatever reason. 
Another neat detail is that when draining the liquor barrels, there is an illusion of the liquid level inside actually falling with each shot. In a game like this, that technology is actually pretty cool. There are also actual photographs used in the restaurant front of Tony's Club, depicting boxers and other people that I unfortunately do not recognize. Some of these may come from an HD mod that I have installed, but I do recall them being there in some form before that addition. As far as enemy placement and such goes, I think it can be a little difficult. Sometimes the characters blend in with the colors of the walls. In a game like this where the enemies have auto-aim and instant fire, that spells problems. If you can get past these and use the environment to your advantage, such as using hanging shirts on a clothesline to block bullets, you'll be just fine. The weapon reused in the mission is pretty cool too. You got a vintage sniper rifle, some old pistols, and tommy guns. If you look carefully at the end of the mission, you can get dual wielded tommy guns before the final battle. This helps immensely with Tony and the respawning Scourge splitters. The soundtrack for this mission mixes peril with sophistication. The drum beats and the classic saxophone sound make you feel like this is your mission, not that of Cortez. The steam rising from grates in the street, the planes flying overhead, they all make you feel like such a small player in the grand scheme of things. But your actions and the soundtrack speak louder than words. Also, there's this part at 316, which is badass. The third mission is probably the scariest, if not the most unsettling. Within the halls of the Notre Dame Cathedral, a creep named Jacques de Lamour has been kidnapping and holding virgin sacrifices. He has been offering them to what he calls demons in order to raise the undead and summon more followers. How he has achieved these powers is a mystery, but the splitters must have something to do with it. As such, Cortez enters the scene in the body of Viola, a hero in a jester disguise. She, along with Mr. Underwood, seek to root out the evil that is being committed here. After rappelling down into the sewers of the cathedral, the duo come across bodies of murder victims that have been rotting away in darkness. As a surprise to them, the bodies begin to stand, then come after them, throwing sickly punches and spewing green ooze. The duo take care of these reanimated bodies and sneak their way into the cathedral proper, through a room filled with wine kegs. Suddenly, flaming zombies burst through a wall and follow the two in a desperate rage. The heroes enter through the newly broken wall to find many young women chained by Jacques, no doubt fuel for his evil purpose. While shooting the heads off zombies, Viola and Mr. Underwood free the women to escape through their sewer entry point. Not all is as it seems though. Some of the captives are actually changelings, made to trick anyone who would dare try to stop the evil plans. After dispatching these creatures and many more zombies, the two make their way into the Cathedral Hall. The time crystal brought by the Reaper Splitter into this era is upon an altar in front of which are many praying undead priests, which are all armed with Lugers, a pistol type that should not exist in this time frame, as they were invented in 1902. This is either more evidence that the time splitters are at work here, or an oversight in the writing. The undead priests themselves have sworn an oath to defend Jacques in return for being made undead and virtually immortal. Virtually. Either way, Viola and Underwood kill these undead priests and hear a scream for help. Above them, hanging somehow from a long rope is another sacrifice. In an effort to save her, the two fight through more zombies and up a spiral staircase to a pulley system. Luckily, the rope descends gently, allowing the maiden to rest on her feet safely. This safety is short-lived, however. Upon returning to the ground floor, Viola and Underwood are met with the maiden and the hunchback, her staunch defender. As soon as they rendezvous, zombies begin spawning in through time portals. The three are forced to defend against the onslaught while protecting the final maiden. With all of this done, the duo hope to ascend the final spiral staircase and make their way to Jacques' location. What they do not expect, however, is a giant demon spawning in the central cathedral, shooting energy lasers and missiles at them. To make matters worse, undead priests and sewer zombies are being teleported in through portals, making the situation even more dangerous. With the use of a handy shotgun, Viola destroys the demon and rids herself of the remaining zombies. She and Underwood then reach the outer rooftop area, where rain pours down by the gallon. More undead priests, along with the Scourge Splitters, are spawning in all over the balcony area. Barely making it through these enemies, the duo finally reach and put an end to Jacques, who claims that the Angels of Time were with him. 
This, no doubt, is referring to the Time Splitters who assisted in his nefarious deeds. Once Jacques is killed, the day is saved, and the work of the heroes is complete. As far as setting is concerned, I think this mission knocks it out of the park. It not only shows a viable entryway for our spy characters to use, but also takes into account that people use it for dumping bodies of murder victims. This just adds to the dread, realizing that these bodies never asked to be here causing problems. They were reanimated against their will. The fact that the zombies slowly stand once you pass a certain threshold adds to the fear, cornering you in a small area and increasing the tension. The dirty green water and metal grates are a good touch too, making this all the more believable as a location. Then you have the first jump scare, a sewer zombie reaching out from around the corner of the first flight of stairs. The wine room is also creepy. The amount of enemies spawned, as well as some being on fire, make the situation very tense. A neat detail is that the wine kegs, or blood kegs depending on which you think it contains, are actually there to put out fire should it catch on to the player. The room full of captives has always been a bit frustrating. The fact that enemies spawn and corner you with every step is really annoying. It makes sense, but if you don't have a quick trigger finger, or are playing on console with the native aiming mechanic, this room will test your patience. If even one maiden is killed by a zombie, and once it starts it's near impossible to stop, then you fail the entire mission and need to restart, as you haven't hit the checkpoint yet. The changelings are interesting though. These are only in normal and hard modes, so they are a surprise if you're used to the easy difficulty. In the next room we are greeted with beautiful stained glass windows and open spaces. These windows can and will break if shot, an interesting detail. Within this room are pews facing the red altar upon which sat the time crystal. The undead priests are here, again, armed with a pistol that shouldn't be in this era. The creepiness factor is ramped up by the fact that they believe themselves immortal. This illustrates just how deeply rooted their belief is in Jacques' evil power. Moving on, the idea of having a maiden hang from a rope is curious. How does she get there? Why is there a rope pulley centered in the cathedral hall? Did the later demon place her here? Why was she not in prison with the others? There was room. Who knows? Moving into the next area, many triptychs and art pieces are seen. Then you get shot. Getting the double garricks is nice, but a little annoying considering the enemy which has them shoots you with aimbot at mock speed. And then there's one of the most frustrating things about the mission. There are flaming zombies that come down the stairs, forcing the player to run away or sit and let themselves die. This only serves to add boredom in my opinion. It just makes you sit and wait, really killing the pace. Another issue I have with the mission is that there are very few weapons you can use, forcing the player to conserve ammo and maximize their aim. In some ways this is cool, but it's a little annoying trying to kill zombies with basic pistols, even with an aiming mod. As for objectives, there are really no secondaries. To progress through the mission, they all must be completed sequentially. Next is the final spiral staircase, complete with annoying zombies that make you backtrack. Moving past the sacrificial cross is a good creepy detail, with the single green light shining in on it. After this is one of the hardest parts of the mission. The Cropolite demon spawns, launching explosive energy bursts at the player while they dip and dodge sewer zombies, which do massive melee damage and spit green projectiles. There are also undead priests armed with the pistols that never stop spawning until the demon is dead. There is a respawning shotgun ammo box, but that does little to calm the nerves when you're fighting an entire army at once. After the Cropolite is killed, he despawns rather quickly. Child me was sad that he couldn't run down and look at the body. Then the door to the outside is open and we see the aforementioned rain. This rain adds a lot to the balcony area as it would otherwise feel like an extension of the previous rooms. It really adds to the illusion that you are now in an outside space. That said, screw this part. There are so many spawning enemies with aimbot and Jacques himself is no pushover either. You basically have to hide behind a wall to survive, if you're lucky. The music for this mission includes Gregorian chant and believable organ pieces. It adds to the atmosphere, allowing the player to consider what the chapel may have been like before the tainting events. Then once the player enters the demon boss battle, the music shifts to a remix, building anxiety and making the player feel amped up to finish the fight. This is undoubtedly one of my favorite tracks, and lives in my head rent free.
In this mission, Cortez takes the place of Hank Nova, a space pilot. Hank is accompanied by Candy Schuyler, another member of the Corps. Escaping his damaged ship, Hank lands on the alien planet X. He then witnesses a saucer fall from the sky, most likely the one he injured in the implied previous firefight. His goal is to reach the downed ship and prove its existence. This will allow him to share intel on the dangerous alien species of the Ozer and Mesermox. These two cousin species hate each other. One is green, the other red. While Hank and Candy move throughout the surface, these aliens fire on each other as well as them. Hank and Candy move through the corridors of the alien landscape before reaching a beach area. Using the gun emplacements, the two fend off waves of Mesermox. They then run through another rocky corridor and encounter exploding bug-like creatures. Continuing, the two eventually chance upon the downed Ozer Mox ship. This ship opens fire on the spawning Miser, assisting Hank and Candy. Eventually, a portal appears below the ship, and Ozer foot soldiers exit and begin charging the beachhead. Taking advantage of this, the heroes enter the ship and spy through some of the surveillance systems in order to expose the hidden UFO foundry. After another large battle between all three parties, Hank and Candy move into the cliffs, finding a set of anti-air turrets. They use these to take out as many UFOs as possible, regardless of the species inhabiting them. Shortly later, the duo finds the foundry entrance they'd seen before. An Ozer UFO spins under an exit portal, preparing to launch. Nearby is a strange portal leading to a time when the first ship was intact. The two heroes enter this portal and search the ship for the time crystal, all the while dodging reaper splitters. Once they have it, Cortez, through Hank, enters the time portal and returns to the space station for the next mission. The first thing I have to say about the design of this level is that the introductory weapons are awful. The constant rebounding of plasma leads to ricochets that sometimes inadvertently hit the ones that fire them. This is also the only usable weapon for a large portion of the mission. At least in Future Perfect you can turn off the ricochet feature. The map is very similar no matter where you go. It's orange and rocky all throughout, making the building structures more interesting. The large green mushrooms and native plants are pretty cool, but most of the mission is just an orange blur. Next, the beach holdout simply sucks. Enemies can and will run all around you, often killing you from behind. The gun is also very loud and has to be fired nearly constantly for a few minutes. The aliens also get to use an alternative fire mode on their weapons that the player does not have access to. Honestly, the whole section is just BS. There is a cool unspoken factor in the mission. Along the way, you can find three parts to build a homing launcher, one of my least favorite weapons and one I almost never use in the mission. However, the collectible bonus is neat. I just wish it was for something more useful. Also, the skybox has very visible render lines that steal from the immersion offered by the other levels. Through this laser door is a pacifist Ozermox that typically runs away in fear, only to stand at the beach and do nothing. He reminds me of a grunt from Halo, but has basically none of the charm. Next, we have these exploding bugs. They're extremely difficult to aim at and serve only to slow down progress in the mission. The green ship is really cool. The fact that both alien species will fight each other is something the player can actually use to their advantage. This mission gets some points for that. Also inside the ship, there is clear damage from the implied air battle between Hank and the saucer. Pretty neat. The following open valley battle is honestly something I've learned to just rush past. It takes a while and uses up a lot of ammo. The anti-air shooting section is okay. It offers some variety and makes the world feel a little more fortified by the alien inhabitants. The foundry room filled with ships is actually really cool, and my favorite part of the mission. The many ships lined up in order silently explains just how much firepower the aliens have. They are well prepared. I do find it weird though that they have a singular camera installed. Like, why? Also, how and why does the single downed green ship have a connection to it? I just don't, I just don't get that. Then we see another cool ship spinning around, which I like. After that, we get shot by super cheap aliens that spawn in. We then enter a strange looking time portal and go back in time, I think, to a time when the ship is intact and the crystal is there. This playthrough was the first time that I didn't get caught in a loop of backtracking to find where I was supposed to go. Again, the mission is a giant orange blur, everything kind of blends in. It also has extremely low weapon variety. It used to be one of my favorites, but now it's just something I rush through. Also, the mission has no checkpoint, so that sucks. The music on the mission, though, is full of energy and is super futuristic. It definitely does add to the power fantasy of blasting through an alien planet.
This level changes nearly everything you know about the game thus far. In it, Cortez inhabits the body of Ghost, a young man that has been framed for a break-in. This guy's just minding his own business. Gets a claw hand to the face. The crime in question was carried out by a group of all-female hackers under the leader Sadako. They framed him because he would not agree to join their gang and assist in the heist. This group entered a government research facility and stole a prototype cyber rig, one that is rumored to incorporate alien biomatter and technology. They then planted falsified computer records at the scene to implicate Ghost. When attempting to confront the hackers behind the crime, Ghost was beaten in combat by Sadako and thrown out of the train. They underestimated his fortitude, however, as now Ghost can follow one of his attempted assailants in order to find their secret base and record proof of their crime, thus clearing his own name. Along with Ghost is Chastity Detroit, a pro hacker who also used to work in the gangs in Neo Tokyo before becoming an officer in the LAPD of the United States. She has vowed to assist him in clearing his name. As they follow Crayola, one of the hackers, throughout the tech quarter, the two avoid the police and carefully steal weaponry from a nearby store, in order to prepare themselves for what comes next. Throughout the streets are civilians and camera systems, all of which the heroes must avoid arousing the suspicion of. If the cameras catch sight of either Ghost or Chastity, they will alert police forces and ruin the mission, as the police forces believe they are guilty of the aforementioned crime. Ghost and Chastity finally find themselves in the entrance of the hacker gang's base. Through some trickery, they access the camera systems and watch Crayola enter the password to the secret rooms in which they house the stolen equipment. Finally, the two can start taking out the enemy hackers and confiscating their weaponry, adding to their ability to protect themselves. Within the secret facility are lockers containing high-tech weapons, as well as rooms full of plans with which the hackers would make use of the stolen machinery. In the next room, the heroes happen upon a gruesome scene. A civilian has been belted to the stolen machine, upon which is a time splitter who has been grafted into the metal, the remainder of his body suspended in liquid below. Ghost takes pictures of the machinery and plans, then uses a computer in the locker room to upload the proof to the internet. Doing so sets off alarms though, activating the machine gun security system and alerting more hackers to come and attack. Ghost and Chastity shut down the cruel machinery and take off from the facility, killing Crayola and many other hackers in the process. The two then take to the streets to escape the madness, but are hurt by more hackers. They then seek out the Master, a wise and mysterious man who is able to heal them before they take on and eliminate Sadako. In Sadako's hands was the Time Crystal. With this, the heroes can escape the misinformed police and exit the tech quarter. As mentioned before, this level is very unlike the others. In fact, you cannot even fire your weapon for half of it, lest you rouse the suspicion of police or Crayola your charge. The fact that weapons are hidden behind noisy glass is another thing to keep in mind. It is important to be able to defend yourself, but you cannot be caught doing so. The mission forces the player to have patience, much like Crayola does when it comes time for the player to grab weapons. She actually waits for a moment, ostensibly because the developers wanted the player to grab the snipers and pistols, both being the same weapons used in Mission 1. Also, Crayola is invisible in hard mode. Mixed with the rain and all, she is somewhat hard to spot. The player is basically forced to use their temporal uplink, noting the different aims of the cameras and police cars. This mission in particular feels very lived in, with civilians walking all over the place, rail cars driving overhead, and hovering police cars performing their routines. The map itself is a mixture of dull grays, greens, and reds. It is an interesting portrayal of where the developers thought we may be at this point in time. Unfortunately not! The neon signs and dreary weather make for a beautiful and nearly haunting experience. There is a lot of grit and oppression to be felt here, the atmosphere thick with corruption and rigid order. Within the secret compound, there is a sharp difference in color and tone. There are computers and laser walls, one which is not able to be opened once closed. If you happen to be a split second late moving into it, you will be blocked out and have to repeat the mission. Done successfully, it will allow the player into the secret hideout and allow them to use the security cameras to spy on Crayola. Strangely enough, Crayola disappears once she enters the compound, only to be seen after the player attempts to exit. This makes no sense unless she can teleport somehow. Could she be a Reaper splitter in disguise? The SBP-90 machine gun is so satisfying to use. It feels fantastic. Interestingly, this is one of the few weapons in the game without an alternative fire mode. Why is there a camera lying around the compound? 
Anyone can and will use it to uncover the treachery of the hackers here. Also, I have no clue what that machine is meant to do. It just looks evil and nasty, which I suppose is the point. Outside the complex, the hackers throw grenades off screen, despite not having weapons that can do so. The police also have the same sci-fi pistols from Return to Planet X. This doesn't make sense in the timeline, so I'll chalk it up again to more Time Splitters tomfoolery. The addition of the Master was a necessity for hard mode, otherwise this mission would be even harder. Graffiti and posters of the main characters on this mission can also be seen. Pretty interesting. Lastly, this mission makes references to multiple media, such as Blade Runner, with its theming and audio design. The 1984 novel Neuromancer, which now I need to read, is said to have inspired some of the cyberpunk themes. Also, the name Neo Tokyo is the same as that from Akira, also set in the year 2019. Beyond the visual atmosphere, this mission would not be the same without the soundtrack. I'm not sure how to describe it, honestly. I've been listening to it on repeat, actually, while writing this section of the script. I'm not sure if the vocal audio being spoken actually translates to anything in English, or if it's simply gibberish, and I don't care. It fits the creepy atmosphere and, amongst the cross now sounds, simply makes the place feel alive. This is one of my absolute favorite tracks in the game, and within the top 25 video game songs of all time for me. Most of them are from Time Splitters or Halo, after all. The next mission sees Cortez take on the role of Elijah Jones, a bounty hunter in the Wild West. The town of Little Prospect is being taken over by goons of a gang led by the Colonel, a deserter from the Confederate Army. Because of his influence, he has managed to order his underlings to capture and lock away Ramona Sosa, a law official in the area. Much like Ghost in the last mission, Ramona has been accused of crimes she didn't commit. Elijah Jones battles his way through the streets of Little Prospect, gunslinging against the enemy gang and hunting for Ramona, all the while ripping down her false wanted posters. When he finally reaches the jail, Elijah gathers some explosive powder and blasts Ramona out. The two now side by side, they continue to march through the streets toward the center of town. A scream is heard, and the duo notice that a citizen is trapped atop a burning building. After killing some more goons, the lawful two put out the fire and rescue the lady. As the civilian runs away, Jones and Sosa continue on to the mining operation where the colonel's band has set up camp. The mining operation has been rumored to have uncovered undiscovered gemstones, a source of money for the malevolent gang. Jones helps Sosa get her revenge by blasting down the colonel and his mining operation, eventually pushing a cart of explosives into the newest mine shaft and blowing it open. Inside, it is discovered that the colonel had found a time crystal. When Jones picks it up, Reaper splitters appear and harass the duo. They frantically escape into the time portal below, making it out just in the nick of time. The overall setting of this map is quite rustic and reminiscent of that old school Wild West we know and love. Even the design of Jones with his duster and cigar. It just looks really cool. Also, he has a really neat hat in the arcade mode. The weaponry, including the vintage rifle and multiple Garrett revolvers, are perfect for the setting. The audio design of the weapons is great too, with the revolver Echo trailing off into the Aether. That was a pretty good shot. Unfortunately, these two weapons, and one later dual wielded, are the only ones available. Throughout the mission are multiple buildings that are simply there for flavor reasons, either including ammo or nothing at all. Walking along the rooftops adds a layer of verticality, basically doubling the playable area in the first section. There is a tiny windmill that seemingly does nothing, and a lot of signs for different shops and such. Buy a horse! <laughs> Just do it! My particular favorite area of this mission is the saloon, complete with beer kegs and a bar. The rustic theme of the level continues until you find yourself out in the courtyard reminiscent of a Mexican mission. Then we see a flag that has 24 states on it, which in the year 1853 is around 10 too few. For that matter, the colonel could not have been a confederate deserter because the Civil War didn't even start until 1861. But I don't expect developers from another country to dig deep in the textbooks just to deliver a fun western experience. Besides, this is chronologically the earliest set level in the entire franchise, so that's pretty cool. Cactuses dot the surrounding desert, making this place feel like a tiny oasis compared to all other areas. The mining section looks like something straight out of Frontier City, and looking back, the explosives in the cart make a lot of sense considering that was how they were mining everything. 
Now I have to air some questions and grievances. For one, this f***er. The first bullshit thing, this right here. You <laughs> we literally just started and that guy always gets a hit on me. As soon as you start, you are blasted by someone who takes away a fifth of your health immediately. Then, as you make your way into the jail, it just seems odd that there's some gunpowder stash there. Unless it was meant to be used by the law people, which is Ramona herself, as far as I can see she's the only local official. When blowing up the jail wall, the solution is not intuitive. I remember looking this up on GameFAQs as a kid and scrolling past walls of ASCII imagery only to see that I'm supposed to line up the powder and shoot a box. You know, because all boxes just explode. Also, when playing co-op, player 2 is forced to just sit there and wait a while until you free them. And Ramona Sosa's wanted posters are all blending in with the browns and rusts of the walls. I used to always miss them and have to backtrack. Without the HD textures, I would probably still have to. I said, by horse. The final battle is also absolutely abhorrent, unless you hide back and take pot shots as enemies continuously spawn. All of that said, the atmosphere of this mission is fantastic. Speaking of the atmosphere, it wouldn't be the same without the heroic backing track, complete with the sounds of whips and awesome guitar. This song serves a bounty hunter just right. The whistles call to mind old western movies and amusement parks of the southern US. As an unwillful resident of the southern US, these serve as one small concession. The hero this time around is Harry Tipper, a dashing rogue on a mission to foil the plans of an evil mastermind named Kalos. Has anyone ever told you you... you have a screw loose? Yes! <laughs> on his island, the villain has a state-of-the-art atom smasher. This could be used for atomic warfare. Tipper awakes strapped to a chair beneath a high-powered laser. Behind the glass, his arch-nemesis threatens him and manages to escape. The station has been filled with bombs set to self-destruct allowing Kalos to make his getaway while also potentially ridding himself of Tipper in the process. Through a bit of tomfoolery, Harry Tipper causes a malfunction in the laser, allowing it to blast him out of trouble. He then makes his way, along with Kit and Celeste, through the door and into the complex. Henchmen in yellow suits patrol the area, holding silenced pistols and forcing the duo to use stealth. Luckily, they happen upon a scientist who also doesn't want to be exploded. After saving him from the watchful eye of the henchmen, the scientist defuses the nearby bomb, adding time to the hero's escape. They later find their way through a corridor with more slowly opening doors, eventually reaching a second bomb. An auto turret threatens them from afar, but is dispatched by Tipper. Once the minions are all taken care of, Tipper and Celeste notice screams from above. Two scientists are on fire. The heroes put them out with extinguishers, allowing them to run and defuse the second bomb. Tipper extinguishes the fire, allowing the quarantine door to open. The duo are immediately fired upon by minions, some of which exit crates in a surprise maneuver. Within this hall is yet another bomb, this time requiring another crank to be spun, as well as the use of a magnet to scramble the machine. Continuing down the hall, the two destroy more turrets and minions, using some remote mines along the way to their advantage. After putting out another fire, they're let into the next room. The nearby lift is only a feint, and the two skip it running along the floor to save more scientists from patrolling minions. They then take out the penultimate bomb. Rounding the corner, Tipper and Celeste clear the remaining guards and allow the final bomb to be defused. Now free of the pressure of time, the two slowly make their way across the ceiling, deactivating the lasers that would prevent their escape. After this, Kalos appears and tries to kill them. However, he has woefully underestimated his foes. He's exploded with remote mines, allowing Tipper and Celeste to take his time crystal and lower the levers in the particle accelerator room. They manage to do so, all the while fighting off both Reaper and Scourge splitters. Once this is done, they make it to the time portal and exit. The design of this mission is nothing short of infuriating. The constant timer counting down, as well as the slowly opening doors and lack of movement options like jumping, are enough to make you want to rip your hair out. The mission absolutely forces you to memorize every single enemy and weapon spawn, devise strategies, and stress out until the very end. Also, the checkpoint is so early in the mission, this means you have to redo the most annoying bomb like 10 times before getting everything correct. 
Also, some areas are just a feint, such as the previously mentioned elevator, causing you to waste time and thus fail the mission. The levers at the end require you to activate them like 20 times before they fall. You have to be perfectly aligned as well. While doing all three of these, you are constantly harassed by overpowered splitters that never stop spawning. It is an immense relief to be done with this mission. As far as the art direction goes, there's nothing but praise. Tiver looks badass and adds some humor to the game. He has a cool blue tux and some shades to boot. The walls and metal floor is added to the industrial focus of the mission, which fits well with the introductory cave section. Although we are told this takes place on a secret island, it would seem less likely if it weren't for this intro scene. The henchmen all look like bananas, or minions, depending on how scarred you are by Facebook memes. The black-suited henchmen have more health and typically have snipers, which can be really frustrating but pose a challenge. The weaponry is fitting, I suppose, but the SK has always surprised me somewhat. Not sure why. The remote mines are an essential tool for this mission. If I could change one thing, it would be to add time to the meter on hard mode, or do away with it completely. It forces you to rush through, causing you to slip up on decisions that could save what little health you are allotted. It also just makes you mad with all the slow doors and everything. This is easily my least favorite mission. When it comes to the soundtrack, the song definitely fits. It has another GoldenEye sort of theme, which makes sense considering the mission draws from James Bond and all that. It adds to the adrenaline of the time-limited rush through minions and bombs. Other than that, I don't have much to say. As far as the sound goes, it has to be one of my least favorites, and not one that I find myself listening to. It basically gives me PTSD. Cortez takes on the role of adventurer in this mission. Captain Ash is on a hunt for the elusive Jade Crystal, known to us to be a time crystal. Searching the Tohochek Temple in Guatemala, he has finally found it and started his escape. Unfortunately, he's followed by a stone golem. Despite his fists of steel... He just punched a stone? This guy has fists of steel! Captain Ash could not evade the golem long enough to escape. He is lost down a waterfall, empty-handed, forced to head back into the temple for one more try. Along the way, Captain Ash and his sidekick, the Jungle Queen, find mischievous monkeys throwing exploding melons at them. Into the ruins, they are confronted by indigenous tribesmen who are attempting to protect the Time Crystal. A wood golem appears, making it clear that the spirits of the region are discontented. Through some ingenuity, they manage to set the creature on fire. After taking him out, the duo make their way further into the ruins, only to find and dispatch another wood golem. Further wrapping around spiderweb-filled halls, Ash and the Queen make their way into a courtyard of pillars. Cortez, skilled in combat but challenged by puzzles, takes forever to manage the pillar solution, making Captain Ash look like an idiot to the Jungle Queen. Once done, the next door opens up and the two are allowed to enter the next area. They take out an evil monkey and throw a switch, letting the nearby waterfall dam break. This causes more tribesmen to patrol, as they know Ash and the Jungle Queen are nearing the temple proper. They drop through a stone corridor and find themselves at the base of the temple ziggurat. Within are even more tribesmen, skilled with their crossbows and relenting for nothing. In the distance, the crystal is seen. This tantalizing sight is but a lure, bringing Ash and the Queen further underground and into the lair of the tribesmen. The two find themselves in rooms with two major dangers. One, there are giant stone golems after them, searching for revenge. There are also more stupid monkeys throwing melon bombs. The monkeys are dealt with in a conventional sense, while the golems are caught in trap doors. This process is repeated in another room, testing the patience and ability of Ash and the Queen. A trapped hallway awaits the duo, but with patience they clear it. They find themselves locked on a bridge above a howling abyss. All around are stone faces, which turn to reveal evil laser eyes. How the tribesmen acquired this ability with masonry, we will never know. Again, I'm blaming the splitters somehow. Once all the laser stones are dealt with, a high priest and regular tribesmen flank the team. They are quickly killed, as Ash and the Queen make their way to the totally not inspired by Indiana Jones like the rest of the mission room, where they must escape a giant rolling boulder. Finally, the two make their way into the treasure room, where the crystal resides on a pedestal in the center. Using some convenient grenade launchers, they manage to kill the stone golems, take the crystal, and escape. Cortez returns to the space station with the penultimate crystal, noticing that the splitters have almost broken through. 
only one crystal to go, and time is of the essence. This mission is one of the most aesthetically pleasing. The jungle plants and mixtures of gray, brown, and bright green are all very cool. I find myself able to forgive the clear skybox barriers. The walls of ruins all around suggest that the tribe has been here for quite some time before managing to create their major temple. Based upon the fact that this temple is located in Guatemala, it would have to be the Maya who are represented here, if I have that correctly, hence calling them the Aztecs would not make any sense. Actually, this doesn't make sense at all with the timeline as the mission takes place in 1920. My inclination is to believe that the Time Splitters have entered this area and persisted as though they were tribesmen, further causing a rift between peoples in human history. It should also be noted that there are inherent issues with a colonial explorer further stealing and intruding on native people. I just wanted to touch on that in case the disclaimer in the intro wasn't clear enough. Anyway, moving on. The monkeys all around the mission are a funny addition and can be commonly heard giggling as you make your way through. Don't trust them, they're evil. Dun, dun. Ouch. These monkeys are bastards. Beehives can make for annoyance to those who are not prepared with flaming crossbow bolts. I always found the wood golems to be so creepy. They're completely silent unless flamed, and will follow the player perpetually until you use fire. Something that child me took a while to learn. Back then, there was no YouTube. I don't know why the puzzle is so difficult for me. You'd think after 20 years I would just memorize which ones to press. The entrance to the temple was one of the coolest things I experienced when first playing the game on higher difficulties. I still hate the monkey bombers though. The architecture within the temple is cool, albeit dangerous. If you don't pay enough attention, you can trap yourself within the holes made for golems. I was originally going to complain that the mission lacks weaponry, but I honestly think I'm fine with it now. The fact that you can pick up crossbow bolts and that you can light them on fire is pretty cool. The vintage rifle is only really necessary for one part, and the grenade launcher is perfectly suited to balance the massive health pools of the stone golems. Now that I look back, this has to be one of the best missions in the game. Adding to the Indiana Jones inspired atmosphere is the soundtrack. Captain Ash runs through the mysterious ruins of Tehochek while listening to the drum beats of native instruments, accompanied by chirping tropical birds. The beat sticks in my head often. Do -do 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 -do. The change of the music once you reach the temple is also really cool. It highlights that this is no longer just a romp through the rainforest, but a deadly mission in which you must succeed. Very cool stuff. The Robot Factory has been host to the production of all manner of warriors in the Robot Wars. These battles have spread death and destruction all over the galaxy. Although the war is technically over, this factory has not stopped. An evil child known as the Dark Machinist has rebooted the complex. He has lost multiple limbs and parts of his body during the war. Now, he wants revenge against others gaining power from that which once nearly destroyed him. In the framework of Gretel Mark II, Sergeant Cortez moves throughout the facility, destroying robots and sabotaging power nodes. By her side is R-109, a previous combatant in the Robot Wars, who watched untold number of his kind die. After a grueling and difficult battle through the factory, the two find themselves at the Dark Machinist's private quarters. He has placed himself within an extremely dangerous robot machine, complete with razor-sharp saw blade emplacements and a giant metal drill. With these, he hopes to destroy the interlopers, but does not succeed. Gretel manages to grab the time crystal powering his mech, and, with R-109, evades the splitters and manages to reach the portal. The visual design of this mission is without flaw. It is cold and brutal, with dark colors and metal thrown all about. Some of the piping and technology seem to have unknowable purpose. There are lasers all across the factory in an effort to prevent the duo from reaching the machinist child. However, they can be used to sabotage the enemy if done carefully. Levers and activators are placed all around the facility, allowing the player to move to the next zone in a believable manner. The factory actually feels like it's functional. The electric tool is useful not only for overloading power nodes, but also stunning enemies. It's good that they respawn infinitely. The power nodes being strewn about the factory also makes sense. If you were a machinery genius, 
It stands to reason that you wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, so to say. By diversifying the locations, he created a difficulty for anyone embarking on a mission like that of Gretel and R109. The robot cameras add a lot to the mission too, especially in co-op mode. One person can go on foot if they're confident, and the other can fire from the shadows. Also, it is used creatively in this mission to allow the player access by proxy into an area that they can never reach otherwise. Here's a cute random robot that cleans the floor and is always forgotten about. I always kill it just in case it's going to turn on me. The final open room is a test of patience. There are many waves of enemies that spawn before you can reach the Dark Machinist's child. Ammo is somewhat hard to come by when trying to fend off many waves of enemies, some of which not even dropping their weaponry. Shielding is another thing. It only takes one or two shots of a rocket, which is held by nearly every sentry that spawns, to remove your shield, and there are only two shields in the penultimate room. If you're lucky enough or find yourself waiting in an anxiety-inducing ambush... Alright, look, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna use the uplink and wait till he's close by. And when I start to see pink here, I'll back up and start doing the same thing I did for the last guy. The sound of those footsteps is menacing. Okay, he's there. Is he dead? F hell. You can manage past this part and reach the final room. Before we discuss that though, we should talk about a couple other things. One, the mission is very long. If you fail, it takes forever to restart. The summary of the story for this mission was short because, honestly, not a lot is said and not a lot of things happen other than, you know, fighting their way through the factory. So I figured I would leave that part brief so we could get on to the, the next parts here. Number two, the enemies. There's a wide list of enemy types, each one behaving differently than the last. First, we have the chassis bot. They spawn with the annoying sci-fi guns that blast ricochets all over the place. The chassis bots are expendable and know it, thus they blast with abandon. Luckily, they're fairly weak and easily stunned with the electro tool. Next is the sentry bot. These are far too bulky and hit like a truck. They're often armed with rockets or laser snipers as well, which only compounds their difficulty. The sound they make when hunting you down is nothing short of terrifying. We also have the aforementioned security lasers. They don't do much damage, but they can be annoying. Not as annoying as the floating bomb bots, though. These things are super quiet and can easily surprise and overwhelm the player. They force you to backtrack, one of my least favorite things in a mission that is already super long. The canister turrets are also interesting. They have two modes, a stationary turret and a mobile form. The mobile form is easy to kill if you either blast the head or stick a nade to it from the plasma auto rifle. However, if you step too far, it becomes momentarily immune, meaning you have to kill it from a close range. The turret form requires you to aim between the lid and the canister, which could be annoying in a pinch. Finally, we come to the last room. This boss is bullshit. Have a fun video of me beating him on my first try while recording for this project. Some of the stuff on this is just bullshit, including what you're about to see, which is this monstrosity. Yeah, how do you... Yeah. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, just go ahead and come on out. Come on out, man. Come on out, friend. You're fine. Alright, do I have anything I can use? Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to run into one of these side doors. Probably that one, or this one. And just wait, run around, wait for one to open up, run in it, grab ammo, turn around, blast this f***er in the face right here, and then grab the uh, time crystal, which is behind him, up on the ramp there. Let's go. Okay. All right, swap. Okay, I get ammo for this. No, what did I get ammo for? Anything? I did, okay. Ouch, I just gotta run. Okay, stop, electro tool. Uh, I press electro tool. Okay, swap, go back. Alright, he's dead. He's dead. Now I just gotta grab the freaking crystal and run in. My heart is absolutely pounding right now. 
Okay. Before I grab it. Oh, oh, he's already here. Come on, run, run, run. Down. Nope. F you. F you. Run, 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 go. Holy shit. Oh my god, look at our health. The hardest mission of the game. First try, no death, one run. And we finish with a tiny, tiny sliver. The track for this mission is creepy but fitting. The atmosphere is cold and uninviting. Not much more to say about this one. The final track, however, borrows from the scrapyard and is an industrial banger. Sergeant Cortez returns from the robot factory with the final crystal. As he does, the splitters break through and unfortunately kill Corporal Hart. Now, Cortez runs around and sets self-destruct charges before beginning his escape alone through the facility. Eventually, he grabs a spacesuit and makes his way outside. Time splitter ships are flying through space in order to escape the station. Cortez prevents this, blasting them all down. Once done with this, he powers through intense waves of splitters from every direction. He eventually finds a minigun and uses it to blast past all the enemies before finally landing down in the hangar again. Once inside the ship, he flies out and sends some missiles at the space station, triggering the ultimate explosion before making a somber trip home. This mission is clearly designed to be a fast-paced run and gun, probably an homage to the first game. However, there are just so many damned enemies that the player is constantly in the red. The Scourge Splitters also have an insanely large health bar. The Reaper Splitters that follow you throughout the mission are also a good pressure to keep you moving. However, in the final room they can be quite problematic. The gunfight with the Time Splitter ships is a bit confusing. Some are trying to leave and some are trying to come closer to the detonating station. Are they trying to kill Cortez or escape? And as a game mechanic it causes a disconnect when the ship you missed before respawns in the exact same direction as before, suggesting the ship turned around and decided to give you another chance to kill it. There is also a glitch where the Reaper Splitter can follow you out into the gun section, strangely enough. It's frustrating when that happens. Also, at the beginning, you can look up and shoot directly into space, meaning that there's no barrier and you are in the vacuum. This is probably just an oversight. Also, I find it odd that all the signage and such are in English. There's also spacesuits and items made specifically for humans. So, this makes me question something. Why is the Time Splitters portal built into our own station? Did they bring it from elsewhere to here and install it? They seem to know how to use the controls and all that. It just seems odd since it was never mentioned, and when the next Time Splitters game begins, the humans have a different type of time portal they've ostensibly created based upon the technology of the first. I think I'm looking too hard into this. The last section of returning to the ship and escaping while something blows up is so quintessentially early 2000s, not to mention a near exact ripoff of Halo CE's ending. The credits roll, with the point of view being a never-ending journey through time, until they notice the fact that no monkeys were harmed in the making of this game. As far as the story goes, it is fairly basic, but has a lot of charm considering you visit such varied time zones and get to use many different contemporary weapons. The way that the time crystals were woven into history is also pretty unique, showing that some of the splitters didn't know what they were getting themselves into. The soundtrack is extremely fitting to each mission and helps to provide a memorable experience. Another thing you won't forget is how dang hard these missions are on higher difficulties. Throughout the video thus far, you may have noticed some complaints about the challenge threshold. Notice I was playing on hard mode the whole time. Some may even think I disliked the game because of some of the things I said. On the contrary, this is one of my favorite video game campaigns of all time. It is so varied in the gameplay style, especially for an FPS. There's always something new being thrown at you, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. Battling through all of the difficult enemies and frustrating scenarios is always rewarded by the music and future scenery, not to mention the unlocks made available for the other game modes in the title. 
Did I mention there are other game modes? The arcade mode consists of two options. One, the arcade league is a set of rigorous challenges set up with the use of the regular arcade mode settings. The other is the arcade custom itself, a bot-based firefight experience with many different options to change. Some of these include allowing character-based stats, changing the background music, and setting what weapons and bots can spawn. Power-ups also appear, including speed boost, shrink, invisibility, and damage boost. The arcade can be played in either chilled, normal, or frantic difficulty settings, all of which change the speed and reaction time of the bots in play. If using a LAN setup, up to 16 players can play together, much like Halo, but with no bots present. There are 16 game types in Time Splitters 2's Arcade. Deathmatch is a free-for-all murder spree akin to Basic Slayer in Halo. Team Deathmatch is Team Slayer, and offers a total of four teams to choose from, red, blue, yellow, and green. Capture the bag is equal to capture the flag. In Bag Tag, there is only one bag at a single spawn point. This is basically oddball from Halo, where the person holding it the longest will win. Elimination is deathmatch with limited lives and respawns. Shrink is a version of deathmatch where the lower in place you score, the shorter your character becomes. This offers an advantage to those doing poorly, as they are now harder to hit. Flame Tag is kind of annoying. You try to avoid being tagged and set on fire. Whoever has the longest time spent on fire before shedding it to other players will lose. As if that weren't enough, you have Virus. She died of the green skin 3.3 hair mustache virus. <laughs> <laughs> this time, one player spawns with green fire on themselves and is tasked with spreading to all the others, who also die and respawn with the fire on them. The goal is to be the last one lit on fire, or to beat the time limit. In small maps, it's really infuriating. Sometimes you may spawn right next to the person who spawns with the fire. Oh! In which case you end the match in a matter of seconds. Real fair. I, again, I apologize if I yell this sh- OH SHIT! Okay, yep. <laughs> there you go. Gold. Okay, let's be done with that. Ugh, I hate it. Vampire is a deathmatch, but with a blood meter that refills with each kill. If that meter empties, you die. Leech is somewhat similar. If you shoot other players, you regain health, but you don't have to keep up a secondary bar. Regeneration is basically what it sounds like. Player health regenerates over time in deathmatch. Thief is kill confirmed from Call of Duty. You basically have to kill people and take a giant monkey coin that they drop. If you don't grab the coin, you don't score. Coins also can be stolen from other players. The Gladiator is the same as Juggernaut from Halo. One player is the Gladiator marked by a white aura. Only the Juggernaut can score. The goal is to become the Juggernaut and rack up as many points as possible while in power. Zones is a territories match. Different areas on the map have lit pedestals. Running over a pedestal will change it to your team's color, meaning you own it. With each passing second, points are awarded based on the conquered zones. Hit. Dude, direct hits with a nade launcher. Do they make you less accurate or something? Or is that like a... something about this character is that she's very inaccurate? Assault is the worst by far. Only playable on three maps, this mode is a sadistic attempt to beat overwhelming odds and complete certain map-specific objectives. Monkey Assistant is a form of deathmatch in which the last place player has monkeys that spawn in and defend them, attacking the person in first place. You can also decide from 16 maps to play through, each with their own recommended set of weaponry and music, as well as bots. Mexican Mission is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Made of stucco and clay, the mission looks to be a religious holdout in the Mexican desert. In the center of the map is a courtyard filled with explosive vases. Below this is a small underground area with torches and shelves. On the top of the map is a small platform allowing access to sniper points at either corner of the largest courtyard. In the middle is a bell that rings if shot. In the large courtyard, a couple buildings exist from which to fire and shelter. There's also a large water fountain in case the player catches fire. The song for this mission is an absolute banger as well. Ice Station is a large complex placed upon a giant ball of ice. In the distance is a grayish planet surrounded by stars. 
Within the central complex is a three-level building with gun emplacements on the corners. The player can also enter and exit from the wide windows once broken. On the corners of either side are small, two-story bases offering sniper positions. These are colored red and blue to distinguish themselves. There is also an underground section that has an exit toward the long bridge off the edge of the world. There are also two exits on either side of the red base. The darkness of the space around begs the question, are we in space? Who knows, but the music takes up more of my attention. The hospital is a creepy map. It is colored in dark, moody shades of green and gray. Along the walls are fridges and morgue cases. Sinks for cleaning medical tools are also nearby. Throughout the map are creepy beds and sealed windows disallowing any view outside. A central medical room hints at where terrifying procedures may have been conducted. The religious aspect of this map is also creepy. A cross hangs above two smiling saints. Nearby are the waiting rooms, complete with benches for those awaiting grim news. One of the saints in the other chapel room is even missing a head. Upstairs there are two exits leading to the different chapel rooms. Between these is the main quarters for patients. Many of the beds are either disheveled or completely overturned. It is a mystery what evils have occurred here. It makes sense then that the music is also extremely creepy. Zombies are the default bot setup for this map as well. Fitting. Training Ground is the next map, and is the setting of one of the hardest challenges in the game, which we will discuss later. This area is loaded with the ruins of stone buildings erected for practice maneuvers. Under bunkers are gun emplacements for repelling invaders. Within the primary bases, there are machines lining the walls and camera controls. These link to remote machine gun turrets that the player can make use of. On the far wall is an active camera that always shows the real-time events taking place near the waterfall, which is the central part of the map. Moving to the low ground, we find the other base. This base is covered by natural rock structures, and draws to mind the Battle Canyon from Halo CE. Again, we have the gun emplacements and a near identical main base. There are two accessible machine gun turrets from which to fight enemies. The soundtrack includes the sounds of bullet fire and explosive blasts. These add to the stress felt by the player when charging the enemy especially as the trumpet comes on playing a war song. Aztec is a map that, like the name of the Aztec warrior from the 8th story mission, seems to be a misnomer. These should actually be Mayan ruins. Anyway, the map is basically a one-to-one -one port from the campaign, while limiting the playable area and adding more weapon and armor spawns. The music is just the same as the campaign mission. Scrapyard is a junkyard full of disposed robots and machines from the Robot Wars. This conflict was a major event in history and has multiple missions attributed to it throughout the series. The map consists of uneven ground placed within a large box. The landfill has useful pieces of metal and ship debris strewn about. Players can hide behind these when reloading or evading enemies. In the opposite corners of the map are sniper outposts, each found through following a small interior section. There's also a large crashed rocket outside the map boundaries, which is pretty neat. You can actually land grenades on it. The music of this map is similar to that of the final boss from Mission 8. It is an industrial piece that is fitting for all the metal waste filling the area. The nightclub is an extended version of the final boss room from Mission 2. Big Tony's club is full of beautiful granite floors, bright chandeliers, glowing blue lights, and fabulous posters. Even the walls are painted a thematic red, almost looking as if they'd be velvet to the touch. There's a specific room containing a stage, no doubt for Tony to give speeches or watch performances. Also, the floor is reflective, a neat feature of this game. Following the halls further, we find the main entryway. It is large and spacious, with many lights and reflective tile. Following the red carpet staircase down to the floor, we reach the entryway, complete with a ticket box and locked doors. A large granite centerpiece stands between visitors as they come and go. 
Outside, the rain is pouring down. Different alleyways lead to ramparts that can be followed up the sides of the walls and sometimes into the interior of the building. One of the bridges is broken though, so watch out. The music for this mission is loud, bombastic, and fun. It's always been one of my favorite upbeat tunes from the game, and is definitely memorable for anyone named Fenton. The hangar contains a large open warehouse with a single plane inside. It seems to be pulled up as far as possible, nearly hitting the wall. The open landing gear exposes neatly kept wiring. The turbines look menacing. A large red H is displayed on the back of the ship. Moving deeper into the hangar, we can find rooms of conveyor belts, most likely used for luggage. A large crane carries packages to and from the top floor and between rooms. It can also carry the player, and gives a statistic in their files for surf time, depending on how long you ride it. The next rooms are filled with more stacked crates, offering hiding places to players. Another of the hardest arcade league challenges takes place here, which we will see later. The music is triumphant and engaging. This map is centered around the penultimate room of Mission 9. It also has the same music. Nothing much is left to say about it, honestly. There are many dead ends, and honestly, a more creative map could have been made, in my opinion. The next map is Utopia. This map is extremely unique and almost feels out of place. There are a multitude of spaceships and saucers on this station, some of them open and revealing small control chairs. This implies that the owners are small aliens, perhaps the typical greys. Moving through this facility shows the player oddly twisting tunnels and claustrophobic pathways. The windows are colored differently depending on the hall, helping a bit to orient the player on the map. There's a control room of orange panels, which is interesting. The skybox is a terrible repeated cloud pattern from Return to the Planet X and the planet in the distance seems to be the same. Maybe these are nearby one another. Next, the player sees a room with tall windows and a cylinder full of fire. This room is very cool and leads the player back down into the room with the ships. The music in this map is weird, funny, and likable, including comical alien chants and techno beats. This is one of the few standouts of the arcade maps. Something that compounds this uniqueness is that it is the only map to my knowledge that is not used in either the main story, arcade league, or challenge modes. Chinese is a map focused around a Chinese restaurant. The kitchen is accessible, complete with fine china and uneaten lo mein. Stir-fry is in a wok and a knife sits upon a nearby table. Beneath the restaurant is a strange set of rooms containing boxes and air conditioning units. Strangely enough, one of the boxes is missing a texture on the side. Within the central restaurant is a gong that can be activated by hitting it. There are also two bathrooms, one of which implies that someone is having a bad day. Green bamboo lines the walls of one room, with red lining the walls of a near identical room. Glass in the dining rooms is painted with cherry blossoms. Seating arrangements are divided by the glass and have comfy white pillows on which to rest. Outside the restaurant are neon signs. One of the signs on the wall is a collection of Chinese characters, professing spirit, energy, peace, and life. A quick Google search confirms some of these characters, but I'm not fluent enough to know if these are entirely accurate. They may also be drawn in from the HD modification I used in this game. The song draws from traditional Chinese instruments mixed with technological beats and drums. Chasm is a map that is just blatantly stolen from Halo. See, this map is very reminiscent of 
a Halo 1 map that was also called Chasm, and I think this just kind of straight up ripped it off, but also I don't know if I'm like, I, I gaslight myself with this because I'm like, I don't know if, um, if that map ever actually existed or if it was only on PC or if it was made based on the Time Slitters thing, but they're incredibly similar. We will call it an homage. Here is a sort of comparison between the two maps. The map in CE takes place in space and is called Boarding Action, referencing the fact that two ships are placed side by side. The Time Splitters version is inside a cave. Totally different! The map is a maze of different corridors, some of them crossing to the other side. One side is clearly run down and in ruin for some reason. The other is bright and clean, a clear contrast in design. I assume this is to orient the player and allow them to know which side they are on. To this day, I cannot memorize all the corners of this map. The next map is Streets, the Time Splitters 2 version. This map is how it sounds and takes place on the streets. Some things to note are the buildings on the sides, through which strategic attacks can be carried out. There's also a lot of graffiti, one of which looks like Santa holding a pistol. A plane can be seen and heard flying through the air above the player. The snow, along with the beautiful song, is one of the best atmospheric experiences in the game. This track is actually one of my tops from Time Splitters 2 and is even better than the original Streets track, which I also like. The compound is a strange one. It's a shipping courtyard with a garage attached. Within this garage are strange green rooms with domino flooring that reminds me of Italian restaurants. Rusted walls and shipping crates offer protection from enemies, but not the rain. Only the few interior buildings on the map can share that. The song is what I could only describe as the coolest of the cool. The site is a construction site located in the middle of a city. There is an unfinished sewer system through which effluent and players can move about. Pallets of tiles and bricks dot the outside. A building is partially completed with exposed girders. These can be climbed and used for a surprise attack. In the center is a trailer most likely used for rest and meetings of the workers. The song is pretty good, it's another cool track, sounding notably heavy and full of electronic guitar. Circus is the next and final map from the arcade. This map is full of sickly pink big tops and rotten wood booths. The circus is located in the center of a massive desert, almost looking like the result of nuclear fallout. The big tops are all enterable. One of them is surrounded on the inside by guest seating with a small arena in the center, and the next is a small room with partition stages. Next is the carousel room, in the center of which is a weapon spawn. The music only makes this map creepier. While running through it, even with no other players on the map, I still felt as though I was being watched. This game has 126 characters. Many of them are visible throughout the campaign, with a few being holdovers throughout the Time Splitter series. A few are unique characters shown nowhere else than in the arcade modes. Here, we will follow the gallery descriptions for all characters and quickly read through them for extra lore. An elite squad of space marines are spearheading the counterforce against the Time Splitters. Sergeant Cortez is a battle-hardened veteran who is proficient with all weapon types and can adapt to any combat conditions. Not just an excellent soldier, 
Corporal Hart is also an expert with all kinds of mechanical and computer technology. She has found her servo-enhanced tritium exo-arm to be a very useful aid in battle situations. The daughter of Dr. Katye Nadir, Ilsa knows no fear and will gladly undertake the most dangerous search and destroy missions. Few men can come close to matching her superb fighting and infiltration skills. Gregor Linko, the Russian bear, is one half of a crack military team working for a covert international consortium. Along with Ilsa Nadir, he is sent on assignments which would cause lesser men to quake with fear. Jake has been battling bribery and corruption in Chicago ever since Big Tony came to town. Tony lost him his badge and had him run out of town, but now he's back, working for Lady Jane's agency and looking to settle the score. This hot-blooded socialite skips Swiss finishing school to set up her own private investigation agency in Chicago. A stickler for fashion, you'll never catch her with anything but the latest in haute couture and semi-automatic weapons. The child of a reclusive aristocratic countessa, Viola assumes the guise of a traveling troubadour as a cover for her true mission, to destroy evil wherever it bears its ugliness. Mr. Underwood has debunked table rappers and fake mystics all over England. Reports of true supernatural phenomena have brought him to Paris. He has joined forces with the Lady Viola to share intelligence in the battle against Jacques de Lemont. Some guys just have it and Hank's one of them. He's seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of... Well, whatever. A leaner, meaner, more square-jawed hero never graced the space operatic stage. Candy graduated from cadet training just two weeks ago. Although there's been cheap talk around the academy that she failed astronavigation, but got a dispensation because she has a cute butt. No comment on that one. The coolest cyberjock in the tech quarter, Ghost can hack an AI core in milliseconds. When he declined Sadako's offer to join her gang, she planned a bitter revenge. Now he is framed for a crime he did not commit, and the Neo-Tokyo police are on his trail. Before becoming a highly decorated officer in the LAPD, Chastity ran with the gangs in the back streets of Neo-Tokyo. She has vowed to help Ghost clear his name and regain his honor. Elijah is Peekaboo Jones's great-great-grandpappy. His life as a bounty hunter began at the age of 16, when he saw his parents gunned down in cold blood by cattle rustlers. Since that day, his mission has been to confront injustice wherever he finds it. Ramona came over the border hoping for a peaceful life, but with her fiery temper and quick reflexes, she quickly fell into work as a law enforcer. When things began turning sour in Little Prospect, she sent a wire out to her old friend Elijah Jones for backup. The crime-busting skills of ex-New York vice cop Harry Tipper are now employed in the fight against international supervillains. This time he's got a license to chill. Nice tux, Harry. Sometimes things get a little too hot under the collar for Harry and he needs some manual assistance from his slinky sidekick, Miss Celeste. Go get him, tiger. What the heck are these descriptions? Adventurer extraordinaire, Captain Ash's exploits have carried him to the four corners of the earth. He's always accompanied by the most glamorous assistants and never averse to stopping for a spot of afternoon tiffin. Just to keep the pecker up, you understand. Tally-ho! Raised in the jungle by wolves, the Jungle Queen's sharp intellect is only hampered by her tight thong and lack of language. Captain Ash has promised to make her a duchess if she comes back to Blighty with him. Gretel II is a second generation precision killing machine programmed with stealth and martial arts techniques from around the galaxy. Together with R109 she has been sent to destroy the machinist's robot army. An upgrade of the now outdated R108, the R109 is a war robot built for heavy duty combat. His reasons for destroying the machinist are more personal than his partner Gretel II. R109 wants revenge for all his fallen comrades killed in the machine wars. It's a monkey. The Time Splitter's evil aura had a devastating effect on some of the more susceptible Siberian troopers, causing massive genetic mutation. Military scientists tried to turn them into super soldiers, but after a series of horrific incidents, the mutants were deemed uncontrollable and placed under maximum security. After buying out the Felucci brothers' olive oil import business, Big Tony turned his now slippery hands to more criminal activities. But liquor, loose women, and the numbers racket weren't enough. Lately it seems he's been taking shipments from dodgy out-of-town characters. A psychopathic murderer, Jacques de Lemoore's mind has been twisted by visions of angels. Now he teeters on the brink of complete insanity. The Ozer hate everything and everyone, especially their close cousins, the Miser. Horrifically burnt in a tenement blaze when she was 10, Sadako's outer scars are nothing compared to the rage and hatred she harbors within. A self-taught hacker, she and her gang have stumbled across technology that could change the course of history. After deserting from the Confederate Army, the Colonel went deep into South America searching for Inca gold. He returned a changed man, evil and in possession of strange allies. 
It's not easy holding the world to ransom, but Mr. Kalos seems well qualified for the job. He's got secret bases, doomsday devices, scores of henchmen, and a penchant for over-elaborate death scenes. He poo-poos his detractors who claim that he got his eye patch from a novelty store and that his first name is actually Archibald. The ancient powers of the Temple of Tehochek have imbued the very rocks with life. These mighty creatures possess the strength of a hundred men. No one has ever dared to ask what they keep in their little sacks. An ageless scavenger, the Dark Machinist Child utilizes any components available for his mismatched body, mechanical and biological alike. He is unaware of how twisted and obscene his modifications have become. Selectively bred for strength and ferocity, Reapers are the main combatants of the Time Splitter army. The son of a saloon girl, Hector was raised in a house of ill repute. After a series of botched holdups, he met fellow outlaw Mikey Two Guns in prison, and the pair became firm friends. Sally's slender sister. She's not big on special cuddles. Since the age of 10, when he blew up his parents' garden shed, Dr. Thaddeus Peabody knew that he was destined to be an explosive scientist. He relishes the chance to further dispel academic stereotypes by running amok with an automatic weapon. The mortal remains of the cathedral monks had been at rest for generations in the catacombs of Notre Dame, but the evil magic of Jacques de Lamour has raised their mummified corpses as flesh-eating zombies, ready to carry out his every demand. Built from scrap and spare parts scavenged from the sprawling machine war scrapyards, the lightweight chassis bots are designed for speed and agility. Adapted from old security robots by the machinist, the sentry bots are programmed to kill anything that moves. The Miser hate everyone and everything, especially their close cousins, the Ozer. The Marine Troopers have borne the brunt of the Time Splitter's onslaught against humanity. Crispin's had one too many brushes with the flamethrower. Even he can't remember what he used to look like. The undead priests are all that remains of Jacques' cult followers. Under his influence, they sacrificed their souls for immortality, providing Jacques with an elite army of dark followers. Louis's been slipping and sliming his way in and out of Big Tony's good graces for years. Every time Tony promotes him, he somehow manages to goof up. Lately, he's hit upon the trick of getting braces to break any bad news to Tony. Slick Tommy fancies himself as a bit of a ladies' man. As quick with a knife as he is with the saucy one-line come on. Jimmy hasn't told him that you shouldn't wear a blue tie with a brown suit. Jimmy Needles is a ruthless assassin brought in from Miami to handle Tony's more tricky hits. This guy's a fruit nut. Every morning he has to have half a cantaloupe melon, two fresh grapefruit, and a glass of chilled cranberry juice or else he's just plain ornery all day. Claims to know the difference between a double tap entry wound and a double entry bookkeeping, but we're not so sure. Should you, the player, choose freely to play as this character, it is under the express understanding that absolutely no warranty, stated or implied, is given for his performance or lack thereof in a deathmatch or any other arcade scenario, whether in existence or yet to be devised. Despite the fact that he always gets the blame when things go wrong, Braces remains a loyal foot soldier in Big Tony's mob. Whatever he lacks in intelligence, he more than makes up for in brute strength. So innocent and so pure, the maiden is the perfect sacrifice. Mary Beth Casey's younger sister. Jo Beth likes to sneak out of her parents' house at weekends to fight crime and kill monsters. Her high school show and tell sessions are really something quite special. The Neo Tokyo Riot Squad are rigorously trained, acting in all situations to control disturbances with an iron fist. Once a high fashion model, Barbie Gimp turned her back forever on the world of glamour when she decided to have surgical steel fighting claw implants. She still likes to watch the hollow soaps on her neural visor. Jebediah is the only original inhabitant of Little Prospect left. While the town was being taken over by the colonel and his gang, the crazy old prospector was at the bottom of a mine shaft drinking moonshine. When he surfaced two days later, he couldn't quite work out what had changed. Venus left her hometown at a young age in search of fame as a showgirl. Despite her obvious charms and her snazzy homemade costume, her career has yet to take off. Perhaps she should have gone somewhere more cosmopolitan than Little Prospect. Mikey was a two-bit horse thief and cattle rustler until the colonel lured him into his gang with the promise of easy gold and loose women. The women were never easy, but some of them had loose gold teeth, so I guess the colonel isn't all empty talk? A callous murderer and card sharp, Jared was rescued from the gallows by the colonel and has been his right-hand man ever since. Always on the lookout for a quick buck, Sally latched onto the colonel's gang for the chance of fortune and power. They latched onto her for a great cooking and sp The henchmen are the foot soldiers in Kalos' terror organization. Outfitted with the latest in army surplus night vision goggles and flattering figure-hugging suits, plus baseball caps, 
They cut a dash in any kind of secret base under attack chaos. A space age pixie, the cyber fairy flits across time zones, drawn to machine technology like a moth to a flame. Found in a burlap sack at the bottom of a well, no one knows if Kipris is a supernatural goddess or just a lady with a fancy costume. Despite many offers of money and power, she has never raised all of her arms on a public stage. Mr. Giggles stumbled into a small English village when he was just a boy. Although he was adopted by a loving family, he was never truly happy until he ate them and joined the circus. Marco's turned coat and switched sides far too many times in his short career of crime. Even he can't remember who he's told what to. Sick with worry, he lives his life in constant fear of mob retaliation. Hatchet Sal got his nickname from his habit of chopping off his unfortunate victim's right hands. He used to keep his trophies in a shoebox under his bed, but one night, after too much cheese, he had the mother of all nightmares and his box of gruesome buddies just had to go. He's cleaned up his act now, but the hatchet moniker stayed with him. The changelings are shape-shifting spirits drawn to Notre Dame by the foul rituals of Jacques de Lamont. The hunchback knows all the hidden doorways and secret tunnels of Notre Dame. Horrified by the evil that Jacques de Lamont has unleashed in his beloved cathedral, he battles to thwart the lunatic's plans. The fetid depths of the Parisian sewers are the final resting place of many unfortunate murder victims and diseased beggars. The dark magic suffusing Notre Dame has reanimated their half-rotted bodies. Infused with stolen life by the Time Splitter's evil aura, the gargoyles will destroy anything foolish enough to stand in their path. They especially don't like pigeons. A demon from another dimension, the Cropolite has been drawn to our world by the space-time rift opened by the Time Splitters. A hideous alien grafting experiment gone wrong, Beetle Man fights out of rockabilly rage at what was done to his once beautiful body. When Kalos bought a cheap job lot of sidekick costumes, some dudes were lucky enough to get first pick. Guess what? They chose black instead of yellow. Yeah, well this dude thinks you look pretty strange too. Around the temple, the thirsty roots of trees have sucked up the blood from a thousand human sacrifices. The souls of these ancient victims now prowl the earth bound within gnarled skins of wood. Modeling the latest in heavy gold jewelry, nose piercing, putting bowl haircut and high performance athletic support, this guy cuts a mean dash through any tropical forest. He's not so keen on prickly thickets though. A wandering Chinese monk, the master's life is shrouded in mystery. Ladies can't resist stroking his beard. A high school dropout with a genius level IQ, Crayola shunned the academic world to become the brains behind Sadako's sick experiments. Bullied as a child, Milk Baby honed her fighting skills in the dark streets of the tech quarter. Now she serves as a vicious foot soldier in Sadako's gang. Once a peaceful amphibian race, the drones were enslaved when the splitters invaded their planet. Spinal implants ensure they will never escape the splitter's control. The time splitter evil knows no limits. Even juvenile drones are forced into labor at a young age. Nothing is known about these fearsome leaders of the time splitters, although their bondage trousers are admired across the galaxy. A few deranged zealots were drawn to the machine wars. Poor Robert 107 is under the delusion that he is a carefully constructed robot sent to save the world from evil. The feeder zombie's thought process is quite simple, eat brainsy brainsy brains. Although to be fair, the stains on their t-shirts are mostly melon juice. Stumpy is the adopted son of Sergio the Magnificent. The strongman despairs of Stumpy's errant nature and malicious pranks, but hopes in his heart that one day Stumpy will grow up to be a little taller. A Ukrainian trapeze artist. Despite the strictures of her corset, Lola still manages a dazzling smile. All the gentlemen love her and she has never missed a catch. Twins from a tiny oriental village, Jinky and Nikki were sold to the ringmistress when they were both babes in arms. Strangely, each claims to be the elder sister. The mysterious matriarch of the circus family, the ringmistress is fiercely protective of her eldritch troop. A political refugee from a distant ocean planet, Calamari hid in a cupboard when the time splitters attacked the space station. Brought to life by a child's wish, the flying snowman traverses time in search of death or glory. Rescued from an animal trap by Lola Veruska, Bear is fanatically loyal and will fight to the death to protect the circus. He's had his fez ever since he was a cub. Leo was once the circus lion tamer, but over the years he's adopted more and more of his lion's characteristics. Until one morning he was found alone in the lion's cage, roaring and dribbling. He has lived as a lion ever since. The circus strongman, Sergio's incredible strength is tempered with his compassionate personality and love of life. He likes to tend his herb garden and collect first edition. Mischief's happy smile and childlike manner hide her true nature, a psychotic killer with a love of death. The last person who twanged her braces ended up chopped to pieces in the taffy pulling machine. The king returns after a sellout tour of holiday camps and working men's clubs. He's the leanest, the meanest, and the badass machinist. Still the best in the business, they say his recipe for special slow braised time splitter and black bean sauce is out of this world. He's quack and he's back. 
flour, brown sugar, shortening, molasses, baking soda, ginger, cinnamon, and some well-beaten eggs. Mix well, pop in the oven, and let the nightmares begin. Frank was always telling folks about UFOs in the skies over his garage, but nobody believed his tales of alien abductions. Look at him now. What do you think? The pesky pop-eyed pissine returns. He breathes fire and has vestigial forelimbs. This guy is straight out of Hatchet Sal's nightmares. Just goes to show crime doesn't pay. Or maybe Sal should have just laid off the cheese. Nikolai is a little too curious for his own good. He's always telling Sergeant Shivers that he knows best and that he can sort out whatever is going on in the secret base under the dam. Private Sand is a reliable foot soldier in the Desert Force. Private Grass is a hardworking grunt in the regular force. Private Cole is a promising recruit to the Special Forces unit. He has a crush on Lieutenant Shade but hasn't dared to ask her out. Private Porley is feeling a little undead after his unpleasant encounter in the caverns below Obelisk Dam. Sergeant Rock is a bit of a matchmaker in the Desert Forces. He's always helping his colleagues to get the girl they want. Sergeant Shivers really does doesn't like working at Obelisk Dam. It's all a bit spooky and he's fed up with Nikolai calling him a scaredy cat. Sergeant Wood is an upstanding officer in the regular force. Sergeant Shock likes to impress the ladies with his special forces uniform. He keeps the helmet shiny and well polished. Sergeant Slate should have stayed away from the biological samples under the dam. Lieutenant Frost is an accomplished curling champion. She practices on the frozen lake behind the dam. Lieutenant Wilde is a striking officer in the Desert Force. She's always had fast-track promotion and many say that one day she's destined to make a great general. Lieutenant Shade is the femme fatale of the Special Forces. Her peroxide blonde hair often surprises the men during undercover operations. Lieutenant Bush used to get in trouble with her superiors because of her unruly hair. Now she follows their advice and keeps it neatly trimmed. Okay. Lieutenant Chill has the distinction of being the only undead woman in the game. Trooper White is a promising soldier in the Arctic Force. Trooper Brown often gets hot and bothered inside his gas mask on desert operations. Trooper Black takes great delight in his work and is always first in line when the special forces are deployed, as they frequently are. Trooper Green's gas mask is a great help with his hay fever on summer operations. Trooper Gray's foul zombie breath fills the inside of his gas mask and makes even his eyes water. Captain Snow is the leader of the Arctic Force. Sometimes the cold climate makes his earpiece malfunction. Captain Sand is the bold commander of the Desert Force. Captain Knight is the daring leader of the Special Forces. He likes to deploy his troops at the slightest sign of trouble. Some of the senior staff officers think that perhaps there's a little too much deploying going on. Captain Forrest is the well-respected chief of the regular force. Captain Payne could have gone all the way to the top. Unfortunately, he volunteered for an experiment in the labs and now he wanders the earth as a soulless monster. As far as bots go, it should also be mentioned that they can perform dodging and somersault maneuvers that are inaccessible to the human player. Also, some bots are impervious to certain types of damage, such as the stone golem when faced with flamethrowers. For a final random arcade detail, there's a weapon called the proximity mine that is only seen in multiplayer. It does what you would assume, but it's strange that it's found nowhere else in the entire game. The Arcade League is separated into three difficulties. These are Amateur, Honorary, and Elite, each one harder than the last. All of these contain five groups of three challenges. Once these scenarios are completed, the player is awarded based upon their performance. They receive trophies ranging from Bronze, meaning they barely cleared, Silver, which is okay, Gold, which is the ultimate goal, and if they surpass all odds, they can receive a Platinum trophy for bragging rights. The win conditions for Platinum are hidden, but have been deduced online. They also unlock the previously shown characters and maps, along with other things we'll discuss later. The first arcade missions are all very easy, as one would expect. They ramp up quickly in difficulty, however, especially within the Team Series challenges. I fully recorded my attempts at all of these challenges with commentary, and I'm considering adding them as separate videos to the channel. Each of them comes with its own description, its own conditions, and generally they're just kind of fun to do. To illustrate the difficulty of some notable Arcade League challenges, I have chosen five and will edit the footage in here. At the very least, I just have to shoot that little camera. Okay, well... Okay, get it, get it, get it. Nice. Okay. Two minutes, did it say? Out of their minds. Okay, there's one below me, I guess. I'm gonna have to restart this whole thing. Okay, I definitely shot a bomb at that one. I know for a fact. And f***ing Harry Tipper keeps taking the good weapons, so now I just have to use this stupid pistol. I just go around it, press A. Alright, don't even need to disable those ones, because we're not going back up there again. 
I got the shield. Just let him take the bait. Minute 21. Minute Below a minute and a half? Is that flat? It is. Ooh, okay. That took me a minute to, to remember how to do, but minute and a half, platinum, that's cool. So there's only me and Cortez. All right. I'll get this rocket launcher, and I'll get this speed boost, and I'll try to kill whoever I can. But I guarantee you they're going to get the bag like they just did, and then... We're gonna have to take them out before I can score. All right, back secured, back secured. Run, stay small, stay fast. And then not only do I have to run it back to my base, I have to run it all the way up here, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do wager that this is tied for, if not the worst. Nice threads is doable. Like, it sucks, but it's it's definitely doable. And I have done it. So we have a minute and a half left, and we are three bags better, two bags better now. That's the thing, you just cannot let them score at all. Didn't I end up using a different method last time? Oh, I remember now. I can start with this method, then go the other way, get that speed boost, and get that shield. Okay. I remember now. Can't remember yesterday. Just remember doing what they told me. That's the strat, y'all. Just don't even worry about preventing them from getting it. Just kill them on the way back. There's only 30 seconds left. If I prevent them from getting it, I think we win the challenge. I don't think I'm going to score in 10 seconds, but... Come on, come on. Oh, I'm so close. Okay, that was gold. Jeez, Louise. Okay, so here is the hardest one nice threads it is our third and final assault mission we play as like the weakest character in the game partnered with the other weakest character in the game against some of the strongest characters in the game um, it takes a lot of luck and remembering where exactly to go and what to do so this one may take a while I don't care if I die stuff respawns quickly yeah I just want to hit the lasers off Remember what I did last time was I... Okay, here. I don't think that's going to work this time, but... Um, come on. This attempt of getting down there and doing... Taking out the things is not going to work, but... I'm going to try it anyway. Just because... God, yeah, I get insta-killed every time. So we're going to have to do this again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, I'm going to... Yeah, restart this. Oh, I'm out of bombs. No. I'm pretty sure I got it that time. You have to have perfect aim. Really? It's like that shield doesn't mean anything. God, come on, move. God, why do I have to be so fragile? Yeah. I remembered something vital just now. Uh, it's too late for it to help me because I got to beat this in five minutes somehow. I've done it before. Okay, at least I changed my spawn location. But I don't have... I don't have anything to help me against the turrets, so I'm just going to die. Okay, that's fine. That was a direct shot. Perfect. I hate when they back up like that. Right up here? Right up here? Ah! Oh! That's it. Okay. Oh. God. Okay. I'll settle for gold. These are perhaps the most notable struggles within the Time Splitters 2 fandom, as far as Arcade League goes. Once you finish them, with an extremely specific strategy, you breathe a sigh of relief and vow never to complete these again, unless you're like me and complete the entire game 100% on multiple platforms. It is 11.18 and I am drinking coffee because I'm insane, 
No, that's not why. It's because I want to play Time Splitters. Is that sane? Who knows? These challenges are not to be confused with the Arcade League. They are something completely different. The first trio of challenges has you breaking glass with increasingly annoying weaponry, even forcing you to use a brick at one point. The final challenge has the player blasting the stained glass out of Notre Dame, which is honestly super satisfying with working aim controls. I feel as though these may actually not be a challenge unless your game has the ridiculous reticle scheme. The next trio is Behead the Undead. The player earns points for killing zombies, more so if they get all headshots. This results in a bonus that lowers the amount of time necessary to win. The player is also bound to a certain area, and leaving it will result in death. The first of these challenges is fun, but the others, not so much. Infiltration has the player use their temporal uplink in clear stages without ever being spotted. These borrow from the campaign missions of Siberia, Chicago, and Neo Tokyo. They also teach the player how to use the system if they never did so in the campaign or haven't started it yet. Banana Chomp sees the player collecting floating bananas as a monkey, the favorite animal and odd obsession of Free Radical. The first is a simple time challenge. The next has the player grab bananas while avoiding zombies. The third and final has the player occupy a wood golem, lit on fire by what is implicated to be the same canonical monkey from the previous challenges. You have to collect as many bananas as possible before dying of immolation. The next set of challenges has the player shooting cardboard cutouts. The first two have the player move through a linear mission, including a remixed Wild West and Chicago. The final has the player sniping through a window at boards. The characters on the board are important as well. If you hit a child, woman, or elderly person, you lose points and cannot achieve gold. It ricocheted. BS. It would seem the goal would be headshots, but even with the lack of a bullseye, the game wants you to hit them dead in the center. Some boards don't even appear unless you check behind certain walls, so be sure to look around. The next and most interesting set of challenges is the Time Splitter Story Classic. These are edited maps with weapon and enemy spawns reminiscent of the first installment in the series. The player must similarly run through a map, retrieve an item, and run back to start, all within a short time frame. These can be quite difficult. They often result in the player running past many enemies and hoping they make it by the skin of their teeth. For the first one, playing as the badass cyborg, the user must acquire a spare brain and return back to the spawn. The music playing is from the original Streets variant in Time Splitters 1. This one isn't too hard, but may take a couple tries. The second of these classic missions is tied with nice threads for the absolute worst challenge in the game. Titled Where Do the Batteries Go, this mission has the player inhabit the body of R107, a deluded human who thinks he's a robot. The player must run this weak character through the same extended scrapyard, but also run back through it. It sucks, however I surprise myself with the result. The final of these classic challenges is Hit Me Baby One More Time a timely Britney Spears reference. Mr. Underwood must run through the hospital, grab a bag of bones slash evil talisman, and escape. This mission is pretty ruthless honestly, but is doable. You just have to run past many of the disgustingly creepy enemies. The final trio of challenges has the player skeet shooting for clay monkeys. The more you hit in succession, the more combos you acquire. Word of advice, don't try using the reticle. Just bank on the auto-aim and take a few tries. Before we get into the more niche stuff, we should briefly discuss the final mode. The map maker has both a basic and advanced option. The former allows for the creation of quick arcade maps, which become a nightmare if you only place a single respawn point because you're trying to make a video and are already 34 pages deep in the script and have become tired as a consequence. You can also choose the music of the mission and the tile set, including Victorian, Industrial, Alien, and Virtual. I should mention here that two of the best songs are hidden here in the map maker, Industrial and Alien Tile Set both have amazing tracks that I will sample here for you.
The advanced building option allows the player to make use of verticality, more room options, enemy spawns and placement, a general heightened amount of items, and finally, the ability to create their own story mode missions. A few preset missions were created, each of them being pretty difficult. I tried it this one a few times before my patience went out. As a kid, I remember spending hours in this silent map maker, creating maps that I had sketched out during class. I took my dad's grid paper and drew fairly good schematics, I must say. This is probably a good part of what led me to Mon Morrowind. I find it neat that Time Splitters 2 included a way for you to continue to make your own fun. This was, of course, before in-game tools were given in the Halo games to create maps. No, I'm not going to comment on Halo Infinite's issues with timing the Forge release. This game is filled with a ton of goofy stuff. Almost all the challenge descriptions have jokes in play. The characters sometimes have laughable stories as well. Then there's the constant obsession with monkeys which, were you not, does continue in Future Perfect. There's even a section in the Arcade League called Sincerest Form of Flattery that references Turok, Half-Life, and Dead Faction, all FPS titles that were once in competition with Time Splitters. Something else I've been holding on to is the topic of cheats. There are 11 cheats which change the game in some manner, most of which are cosmetic, including big heads, small heads, hats, types of which are unlocked individually, big hands, large characters, all characters visible, which would make for a good hard mode challenge, slow motion deaths, cardboard bodies, and slow motion heads. All of these together look like an absolute nightmare. There are two other cheats as well, infinite ammo and paintball guns. These would couple well with a potential hard mode challenge in which all enemies are invisible. I don't know if I want to go through that, but we will see. Another thing that season splitters may find missing from this video thus far are the hidden minigames. These minigames are found throughout the campaign missions on hard mode and allow the player to goof around. You want me to clear a Russian base of evil biohazards? Nah, I want to play Snake. To find this, cross through the dam and check the shelves of the first room you enter once out the other side of the water. You want me to hunt down a group of hackers and clear my name? Nyeh, yeah, I'd rather play Astrolander. This game is located in the secret hideout within the lockers. You want me to stop a demented child from reinvigorating the Robot Wars? Retro Racer. Retro Racer is found in the penultimate room of the Robot Factory. No doubt if you made it this far, you find the game interesting and probably want to try it out yourself. Copies of the games for older systems can sometimes be found online or in vintage game stores. These would be for PlayStation 2, Xbox Original, and GameCube. You could also play the game within the newish title, Homefront The Revolution, although I think this only includes the campaign. It's also been made backwards compatible for the Xbox One, and is on sale within the Microsoft Store along with the third installment of the series. If I were you though, I would hunt it down somewhere on the web. I own multiple physical copies, so I don't feel too bad about suggesting that. Unfortunately, I cannot share directly where to find it, but you're probably resourceful enough. What I can share is a link to both the mouse injector and the HD textures. The mouse injector was credited to the following on screen. The HD textures were created by Reddit user Zevengar, hopefully I pronounced that right, and can be found with a link in the description. Of course, download these things at your own risk. Be careful out there. Finally, there's a potential option on the horizon, or two potential options. The first is a fan-made redux called Time Splitters Rewind. It looks beautiful and makes me excited, but we do not have a release date yet. I have and will continue to follow this project as it progresses. You should too since they're on YouTube, link in the description. The second option honestly has me the most excited. Free Radical has apparently got back together and are at work on some sort of project. I'm hoping for either a remastered collection of all three, complete with achievements and quality of life updates, or a completely new Time Splitters title, although I'm not sure that would make any chronological sense. Then again, this game does not take itself too seriously. This game is near and dear to my heart. It has provided me with so many fun memories and experiences. Every year I do at least three playthroughs, often including friends on my old Xbox console. The game released as a complete and content-rich package, something that is fun and easy to pick up and run with. These days, that's hard to come by. I cannot recommend this game enough. I want to say thanks to the developers, to the creators of the Mouse Injector, 
the creator of the HD texture pack, and also a direct thank you to Graham Norgate. This music lives in my head every day and has given me memories that no other experience could. I genuinely listen to these songs all the time. Doing homework, chores, writing, you name it. I don't know if this link is still actively watched, but you can find Graham's Bandcamp at the link in the description. If that still works, you can pay 5 bucks and have all of his music at your fingertips. Finally, I want to thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. It took multiple months of gathering footage and writing the 40 page script piece by piece. This is the last large video I'll be able to create for a while, as the semester is beginning again, but I hope this is worth it. If you like this content, feel free to like and subscribe for more. It will come eventually, I promise. Thank you all, and I'll see you later. Because it's time to split! <laughs> Ouch! That's not cool, man.